The World Ends With You is probably the most meaningful piece of media I've experienced in my life so far. As a pretty anxious, depressed, closed off teenager, Neku's journey of self-discovery and growth, slowly learning to open up to people and place his trust in others to truly expand his world and experience a more fulfilling life, resonated immensely with me back in 2008 and has remained just as influential to me all these years later. Of course, this game is far more than just one character journey, every other aspect surrounding Neku is just as well well done. His partners, Shiki, Beat, and Joshua, are all amazing characters in their own right that go through just as much growth and I could see them being just as influential to others as Neku was to me. Well, except for Joshua. The world and characters beyond the main cast are equally compelling as well and create an experience that is just so engaging and full of life. And beyond the world and story, The World Ends With You is just an incredibly well-made game. One of the smartest designed RPGs out there. Every mechanic is immaculately designed and implemented, and everything is just so fun. From the exploration, to the combat, to the Tin Pin Slammer minigame, which is way deeper than it had any right to be. This is a game that I can come back to at pretty much any point in my life and be just as enthralled from start to finish. There's truly nothing quite like it, and it really needs to be experienced to be fully appreciated. But while being a fan of the game was really easy, that wasn't always the case for The World Ends With You as a franchise but not for the reasons that you'd probably expect. It's not like some of Nintendo's franchises where a series will get a new game and then it'll just disappear for 10 or 15 years. We had known for quite a while that a sequel to The World Ends With You was in the works. In 2012, Square Enix released The World Ends With You Solo Remix, which is a mobile port of the original game which tries very hard, bless its heart, to adapt the game from the original dual screen design to a single screen. But it wasn't a completely bare bones port, it actually added a few new things. First is that it introduced most of us to Coco the Reaper, who would end up being very important to the story of the series eventually, but doesn't really do much here here, and I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking she was just a throwaway character made for this version. All she really does here is peddle microtransactions in a game I already paid $30 for Square. Why do you do this? The second edition is far more interesting, however. When you beat the game, instead of just being booted back to the title screen like you'd expect, you are instead greeted with this image. A girl holding Mr. Mew looking up with 104 in the background and the text reading, New 7 Days across it. Now I didn't actually see this for the first time in game. I don't play very many mobile games nowadays. I definitely wasn't playing them back in 2012. But when I saw it for the first time online, I went absolutely ballistic. I mean, could you blame me? The World Ends With You was one of my favorite games of all time and it was getting a sequel. It had been four years since the original game's release, so if they were teasing something now, then they were definitely ramping up to unveil something soon, right? Yeah, all news about this follow-up completely fell silent after this, and the next several years were agonizing, knowing that Square had been cooking up something, but for all I and all the other fans knew, it had been canned and we were never going to see anything from it outside of this one image. And while that was obviously disappointing, and I'd always want to see more from Neku, Shiki, Beat, and the rest, considering the impact The World Ends With You had made on me, I felt that even if we only did get this one game, that would have been enough. Then out of nowhere, six years after the original release of Solo Remix, Square just absolutely blindsides everyone with a new enhanced port of the game for Nintendo Switch, Final Remix, which not only adapts the original's gameplay much more accurately, albeit not perfectly, but also added an entirely new post-game story which directly sets up a sequel, one where Minami Moto is going to be Neku's partner? Boy, that sure seems weird. I hope they do something interesting with that. Yeah, unfortunately, Square Enix was Square Enix, and many of the things that were teased in Solo and Final Remix didn't end up coming to pass as they originally intended. We did eventually get an announcement for the long-awaited sequel, now known as Neo The World Ends With You, but it was quite a bit different than anyone had envisioned it being. For instance, the girl from the original image was intended to be the protagonist of this second game, but while she is still around, she is far from the game's main character, and Coco hinting that Minami Moto 
being Neku's partner for the new Reapers game also didn't really happen, since the gameplay of the sequel ended up being so different from the original that they had to entirely scrap the partner idea. That being said, I was still absolutely beyond excited when I first saw this trailer. It looked exactly like what I wanted to see out of a sequel to The World Ends With You. It was really stylish, the gameplay looked like it had a lot of promise, and the music from the trailer was just so good. It really had everything it needed to be a big success in my mind, but it simply wasn't. Now there's a lot of reasons as to why that could have been, but the general consensus is that Square sent this game out to die with very little marketing. Now I have a bit of an inkling as to why, and while it may not have been the main reason, I kind of feel like this may have been a factor. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but this game was revealed and released during the middle of the COVID pandemic, and while that is definitely no reason to just send the game out to die with no marketing, it does get a little bit trickier when your main character is running around the streets of Tokyo wearing a chin diaper. I personally don't really have an issue with Rindo's design at all, obviously the game's world has nothing to do with the real world events surrounding it, but I would not be surprised at all if some marketing suits were a little hesitant to toss money at the game at the risk of seeming insensitive. My baseless speculation aside, all we know for sure is that Neo ended up pretty much flopping, and that's a shame. Now I personally bought the game on day one and played through it pretty much immediately. I did enjoy it, but for some reason it didn't grip me quite as much as the first game did. While I did roll the credits, I didn't do any of the optional content beyond that, I didn't even touch the post game, and I feel like it's time I remedied that and gave this game another chance to win me over as much as the first game did. So let's dive into Neo: The World Ends With You and roam the streets of Shibuya once again. And just before we get started here, if you like what I do and want to help out, like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you really want to go above and beyond, you can join my Patreon, you'll see these videos a week in advance, get exclusive updates, and even occasionally get an exclusive video. Alright, plug over. So the game starts out with our main character Rindo meeting up with his buddy Fret at 104 in Shibuya. Fret has participated in Shibuya's number one pastime, buying random pins, and has got one for both himself and Rindo, a weird looking red skull pin. Fret literally throws it at Rindo like an idiot, but luckily a random passerby who is definitely not incredibly important to the story overall picks up the pin and gives it back to Rindo. Rindo notices that his only friend in his Pokemon Go knockoff game Fango, named Swallow, is apparently in Shibuya as well. Well, and Fred convinces him to head down to the Scramble Crossing to see if they can't meet up. But that's where things start to go awry. Rindo gets this vision of sorts, showing the Scramble in chaos, just before a bunch of explosions start to go off. A man appears on the Jumbotron, saying a new game has finally begun, and Rindo's vision seems to come true, resulting in Fred being killed. At that moment, his Bites the Dust power activates, and knowing what could happen, guides Fred out of danger. Then we get the intro movie, which is absolutely incredible. The visuals are fantastic, giving us a hint as to who we'll be seeing and what they can do, and man, the music is just so good. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but the intro is basically a medley of some of the game's best songs, and it is just awesome. Anyways, Rindo and Fret then meet Shoka, a member of the group she calls the Reapers, who gets them registered for the Reapers game. Rindo and Fret are obviously really confused, they have no idea what's going on, but since it seems like no one is going to bother explaining what the hell the Reapers game is, or why they're playing it, they decide that they just kinda have to play along for now. This intro is fine, it does a good job of setting the overall tone for the majority of the game. In contrast to the first game, which really sold the isolation that Neku was feeling, the helplessness of his situation, and how horribly in over his head he was with the Reapers game on his own, Neo is a lot more upbeat, at least on the surface. It focuses on Rindo and Fret's existing friendship, and does a lot to plant a bunch of different narrative seeds right away that really benefits multiple playthroughs, including Fret's first use of his Remind power, which happens so fast that you probably wouldn't even notice it upon a replay. That being said, while I do understand why the intro is the way it is, how it introduces the Reapers game and all that, which we'll get into later, it is significantly less impactful than the first games. That intro was perfectly crafted, it showed a lot about Neku's character, and immediately showed how high the stakes were, whereas this one leaves the players in the dark. Obviously, if you played the first game, you know a lot more about what Rindo and Fred are in for than they do, and are likely to be a lot more invested 
in the mystery than even they are, but on its own, it just doesn't really land as well as I think it could have. Anyways, this first week of the Reapers game is mostly setup stuff. Rindo and Fret learn more about how the game works, like that you have to be dead in order to join the game, which is very weird, as it definitely didn't seem like they died before joining up. Throughout the week, they also meet a bunch of other people, Reapers and players alike, including the leaders of the other teams that the Wicked Twisters, as Fret renames them to, will have to compete against in order to get out of the Reapers game alive. They also learn the hard way that in order to win the game, they're going to need to build up their team a bit. It's really just the two of them at the start, and considering other teams, especially the Pure Hearts and Varia Beauties, effectively have armies at their disposal, they're more than a little outnumbered. Now, they first bolster their roster with Shoman Amimoto, one of the villains of the first game, and I hope you played the Switch version of The World Ends With You, because otherwise you will have no idea why he's alive. Uh, also for other reasons that we'll get into later. A few days later, they recruit Nagi, a Fire Emblem Heroes player. She joins up permanently, but if you know anything about the Grim Heaper, you shouldn't expect him to be around for too long. Him sticking around with Rindo isn't for the benefit of the team, but to pursue his own ambitions, and at the end of the week, he bails to go do math or whatever. Obviously, the game isn't going to leave the team shorthanded for long, so once Minami Moto factors off, he's replaced pretty quickly. Late in week one, the game introduces a mysterious character that everyone is calling Neku for some reason, despite despite having blonde hair instead of orange. Obviously, this isn't actually Neku, and is instead revealed to be Beat. Man, I was so happy to see this reveal. I was kind of expecting Neku to show up at some point, but I wasn't quite sure about anyone else, and having Beat join up with the team instead, relatively early in the game at that, was such a treat. Beat is awesome, and he adds such a great dynamic to the rest of the crew, which definitely needed an injection of energy. Beat also makes a gameplay contribution. He gives Rindo the sound surf ability, which lets lets the team get around the city much faster than through regular walking, but his narrative additions are definitely where he makes his biggest impact. These guys do want to win the Reapers game, but honestly with just Rindo, Fret, and Nagi, their chances of remaining motivated enough to reach their goals just wasn't very high. There's only so much that Fret's can-do attitude can handle. On the topic of the Reapers game, let's talk about that and how it's going to work this time around, since the game is largely structured around it. So if you're unfamiliar with the series, the Reapers game is a competition that lasts over seven days in the UG, or Underground, which is a higher plane than our normal reality, or RG. Certain exceptional people are sent to the UG after dying in order to compete for a chance to win a second shot at life, or any other wish. Originally, players would be paired up with a partner for the game, but this time around, it's full teams with no fixed size limit. The reason the game's different now is because the group of Reapers that are running it aren't native Shibuya Reapers. The majority of Reapers in charge now are from Shinjuku, who immigrated after their city was mysteriously destroyed and over time took over and instilled their own rules. Now, most people would probably wish to return to life at the end of the game, which is what the Wicked Twisters want, but the reigning champs, the Ruinbringers, historically have wanted the exact opposite. They seemingly win every week, and every week they simply choose to go around again and play the game from day one. This is rough enough for the other players as is, since if the Ruinbringers keep winning, no other team will have a chance to get out but it actually gets even worse. Every week, the team with the fewest amount of points gets erased from existence, so this puts the Wicked Twisters in between a rock and a hard place. The Ruinbringers seem unbeatable, but if they don't build enough points, they'll be simply erased, so they really only have one option, to go along with every mission and try to build up points. That's largely the goal of the Wicked Twisters, to keep their heads above water from week to week, while doing everything they can to try to figure out how to take down the Ruinbringers and free themselves from the game. This this is a decent enough hook, but thankfully the game does a good job of keeping me interested with its gameplay as well. Every day is a new mission, and most missions are pretty unique and have the party doing different things, like trying to find out about several urban legends from around Shibuya, or trying to hunt down a particular pig noise that will award the team that defeats it an enormous amount of points. There are a few days where a mission type repeats, but there's always a really cool twist when that happens. For instance, there are multiple scramble slam missions where the goal is to go from area to area taking control of the opposing team's turfs. In the first one, it's really simple, and after the fact is just a big brawl against all three of the opposing teams at once. The second Scramble Slam changes things up a bit depending on how you tackle it. It gives you the option to split your team up, and if you do, the fights in each area will be harder, but you won't have to do as many. On the other hand, if you don't split up, the other teams will have more chances to take their turf back while the Wicked Twisters' skeleton crew tries to keep up. The third one is deceptively simple. 
It's a very small main event with a secondary target afterwards, but in order to reach that target, everything needs to go absolutely perfectly. Unfortunately, Rindo is a very indecisive and timid guy, so he's very likely to make mistakes. Thankfully though, he has an ace up his sleeve, a special ability given to him by his player pin that makes any all but impossible task seem a little more manageable. Rindo has the ability to turn back time, and this has a huge impact on the structure of the game. Now this doesn't have in every mission, but most missions follow a pretty similar path. First, the crew get their mission, and they do what they can to accomplish it to the best of their abilities. Unfortunately, they hit a roadblock that was either completely unanticipated or is largely insurmountable from where they are, guaranteeing that they'll fail. When it all hits the fan, Rindo's power, named Replay, activates, which lets us replay several sections from the mission back again with knowledge about what could happen to try to avoid that future. Now, this is a really interesting mechanic that has a lot of potential for some really cool mission structures and branching story paths, but unfortunately, Neo typically uses it in the most basic way possible, and it ends up being pretty underwhelming as a result. Not only narratively, because it does an amazing job of removing stakes from any situation before it's used, as Rindo gets a free story mulligan every day, but also in terms of gameplay. So the way it works is when it activates, you'll get one or more times you can go back to, all of which will have something you need to do in order to progress. But it's not like true time travel where once you go back, you can keep going from that point however you like. Instead, each of these times you go back to end up effectively being side areas that you just warp to that change the outcome of the final section. When you replay a time, you are almost always limited to that one area you went back to. You can't do any exploring from that point at all. This ends up being particularly frustrating because you never know when a replay is going to trigger, and once you start it, you're typically going to be locked into it until the end of the day. So if you were exploring around, trying to find secrets, side quests, pig noise, things like that, but end up triggering the day's replay, well, then you're just railroaded until the end of the day in sections with no exploration and no side content, just doing what needs to be done to get to the next day. Now let's be perfectly clear here. It's not like replay is never used creatively or effectively. It definitely is on occasion. One mission in the third week Week is entirely played through replay, Rindo has forgotten about everything that happened on that day and all he knows is that he managed to get replay activated. So he has to slowly work his way back from moment to moment, rebuilding his memory about what happened that day to try to avoid the catastrophe that awaits him at the end of it. That always stuck out as a really interesting use of replay and is one of the most memorable missions in the game because of it. Not only structurally, since it's entirely done through replay, but also narratively, since we start out in a position where Rindo can't just control Zed his bad decisions. I just wish there were more days that used replay like this or allowed for branching story paths, because days like this are unfortunately the exception rather than the rule. That being said, Neo does do a good job of making up for a lot of replay's limitations by being much more open and liberal with your ability to replay previous days. In the first game, you had to complete the entire story to replay days, but you unlock that ability in the first week of Neo, and I really appreciated that, because there are a lot of things to do on any given day and you'll definitely want to complete them. Early on in the game, you may notice that a few things are just a little too inconvenient. Like, you can't carry a lot of money, you only have one battle difficulty, you can't sell more than one pin type at a time, that sort of thing. These are the sort of small quality of life decisions that don't make a huge impact on the flow of the game on their own, but over time, if you fumble them badly enough and often enough, it really does make the experience worse. What Neo does is pretty unusual and pretty interesting because it ties many of these quality of life features to its optional content. One of the things that you unlock pretty early on is the social network, and this is actually one of the most important features in the game. On the surface, it shows you quite a bit of fun info. It shows you all the characters you've met so far, some of their social connections with others, that sort of thing. I adore these features. Xenoblade Chronicles Affinity Chart is legitimately one of my favorite things about that game, and the social network brings a lot of that same energy, but goes even further because it ties those connections and characters back into the gameplay. In the social network, you'll notice that pretty much every character has a quest that's associated with them. Some of them are pretty simple, like eating at a restaurant a set number of times to unlock new menu items, but some of them are far more important. Everything that I mentioned as being an inconvenience earlier, well, they all get resolved by completing certain quests throughout the game, as well as unlocking new features even beyond those. What's even more compelling here is that once you finish a character's quest and unlock their node in the social network, on top of that 
gameplay reward, it also unlocks that character's bio, and I love reading these. It's definitely a small thing, but it does more than you think to fill out the game world and make these characters, which mechanically don't even really need to exist most of the time, into full facets of the city, making Shibuya feel more alive. However, I do kinda wish that the characterization and relationships the game shows off in the social network were a little more obvious when directly interacting with these characters in the world. For instance, the shopkeepers. Just like in the first game, they do end up getting more dialogue as you spend more money at their shops and they begin to like you more, but for the most part, how they relate to one another is something that you'd never be able to find out without reading their bios in the social network, and that's unfortunate because the first game managed to do that perfectly fine through just their names, designs, and dialogue. For instance, these two. Like, yeah, you could probably guess that there might be some connection between them because they work at the two available record shops, but if you want to know that they're both in a band together with Sayako here being their lead vocalist, you'd never know from just interacting with her. This kind of makes the shopkeepers in particular a little less interesting, since while their personalities do shine through, I knew that no matter how much I interacted with them, I'd never really get to directly learn anything more about them that wasn't just customer employee small talk. I kind of feel the same way about reading thoughts as well. So just like in the first game, you can press a button in the overworld to scan the area, which on top of showing you enemy locations also shows you a bunch of people's thoughts out in the RG. I loved doing this in the first game. Every new area I'd get to, I'd scan and read every single thought, but I wasn't really doing it that much this time around. I think there's a few reasons for that. First is that it takes so much more time to actually read these thoughts. In the first game, all you needed to do to read any one thought was just touch the screen where they popped up and you're good to go. But in Neo, you have to physically move around to every single one in order to actually read them. This is somewhat inconvenient on its own, but while scanning, you're also really likely to run into enemies, so I was less likely to be scanning in the first place when my goal wasn't explicitly for fighting. And lastly, I kind of feel like the dialogue isn't quite as charming this time around. It's still fine, the dialogue is decently well written, and I do like how every character gets their own social media handle in the corner of their dialogue box. It kind of brings their thoughts into the modern social media age that way. But to overcome these other issues, it would really need to be a little bit more than that, and it kind of just isn't. So unfortunately, this is something that I did for a while during my first playthrough and kind of just fell off from there. And these issues are a bit of a bummer, especially since the rest of the city is represented so well here. One of my favorite things about The World Ends With You was how it managed to capture the essence of the urban sprawl, the punk underground subculture, and how it affected the tone of the game. Obviously, this is a fantasy game, we've got alternate dimensions and people throwing fire magic around, that sort of thing, but the fact that it's grounded in a real city and not even just in name only. The majority of areas you'll be moving through here are direct representations of real life places in Tokyo, did a ton to make the story feel more real and relatable. I'm happy to say that Neo is able to capture this same feeling and kind of manages to make the city feel even larger and more imposing than it already was. For instance, as you're walking around, you'll occasionally hear people having their own conversations, living their own lives, which is a nice little touch. If you ever go walking around busy streets, you're bound to overhear parts of conversations as you go, little pieces of other people's lives that you'll never see any of the depths of, and basically end up as part of the scenery. It all becomes a part of the experience, and this is realized pretty well in-game. The city itself also feels quite a bit larger than it was as well. Obviously, the scale of areas was pretty limited on the DS, but it still did a good job of making Shibuya feel large, and Neo does one thing that really amplifies that feeling. So, while this game is a full 3D experience, when you're moving around the city, there's no free camera movements at all. This is a very strange decision, at least on the surface, since you're going to end up in situations where you're going in one direction, and the camera angle will suddenly change, sending Rindo careening directly into the nearest wall. But this is actually used really well in certain areas, since the camera will pan upwards, giving you a good look at the tops of the city's buildings. But what really sells the effect here is how the buildings warp and shift as you move around. It's really disorienting, but as someone who lives in the middle of nowhere and rarely ventures into the big city, I get dizzy every time I go walking around the streets of Toronto and look up, and it mirrors that feeling really well. Now the layout of Shibuya itself has changed quite a bit from the first game, and I think that it's a huge improvement, since they trimmed a lot of the fat, and removed or combined some areas that pretty much all serve the same purpose together to make each area more unique, as well as help with the overall flow of exploration. For instance, the Katoi City and Shibu department store areas have been completely removed, so you can get directly to Tower Records from the scramble now. Similarly, Molko has been kind of split between Tower 
records in Spain Hill, once again reducing the amount of travel time between these two areas. They've even extended the Miyashita Park area directly to the Scramble, which is pretty great, since it's another way to get to Cat Street very easily. That's not a huge deal just on its own, since the other areas brought Cat Street a lot closer than it was originally anyways, but it's a cool new connection that makes finding and completing side quests a lot easier. Actually, while researching for this video, I found out that it wasn't actually Neo that did this, it was Tokyo itself. The real-life Miyashita Park got a lot of expansions and renovations that finished up in 2020 and were then represented in-game. So thanks, real-life city planners, you did a great job at making this game world a lot better. Anyways, on the topic of side quests, I wouldn't say that they are great, but they are at the very least serviceable. They're pretty much all small little tasks that you can do while you're exploring around during a day and rarely have long overarching storylines of their own, which is fine considering the game's structure. It doesn't exactly allow for that sort of thing to be done very easily. Now, there are a few quests that affect the game in the long run, like one early on with Ramen Don who's doubting his curry cooking ability. If you do this quest and then visit his store the next day, he He'll open up his shop and it'll remain open for the rest of the game. But if you don't, that store never opens, depriving you of a vendor and keeping his social network node locked. But most aren't that interesting. They usually just have the party go around imprinting words into people's heads, often to hilarious results. Using Fret's special ability to move the story forward, it's literally just the Batman Arkham Asylum unlocking minigame that unlocks the rest of the story instead of a door. And of course, the vast majority of side quests require battling, usually using Nagi's special special ability to dive into people's minds to see the darkest secrets of their internet search history. And that brings me to the battle system. Now there's a lot of things I love about The World Ends With You, but one of the main things that kept me coming back to it time and time again was that battle system. It's easily in my top three favorite battle systems of all time. It's so deep, so perfectly designed and I was super excited to see what the team could do with a sequel. So my expectations for Neo were very high, and I was so relieved to see that the team has at least tried to bottle that lightning a second time. So right off the bat, we need to talk about a few of the mechanics that surround the actual battle system, since it's integral in making the world ends with you what it is, and Neo proudly follows suit. So in order to enter a battle, you need to scan the area, which will show you a bevy of noise symbols, each representing a group of enemies that you can battle. What makes this more interesting is that when you run into a noise symbol, you aren't immediately transported into the battle arena. You can instead run around gathering more and more noise together, and once you do enter the battle, each noise you gathered plays out in a separate reduction battle. This is something that you'll want to do a lot, since each symbol added multiplies the overall battle's item drop rate. Early on, you can only stack up to four noise symbols at once, but as you fill in the social network, you unlock the ability to chain up well over a dozen, and this makes a huge difference in drop rates. Now obviously this is a bit of a risk reward system. Sure, stacking multiple battles together increases the drop rate, but you're also a lot more likely to get yourself killed, since you know you're fighting many battles together without the ability to heal in between. But that's not even close to all of it. Neo, much like its predecessor, has one of the most adjustable and fluid difficulty systems basically ever, and it does an incredible job at encouraging the player to step out of their comfort zone not only into more difficult, more precarious positions, but also the opposite. So there are four difficulties you can unlock in Neo. Easy, Normal, Hard, and Ultimate. Ultimate is post-game only, and it's obviously the most dangerous of them all. Now, typically most games with difficulty settings like this won't have much for the player on each individual level, aside from a different gameplay experience, and once you've hit a difficulty level you're comfortable with, there's very rarely any reason to move that around. But in this game, every enemy has a set of pins that they can drop, which are either used in battle or as currency for other items. The twist though is that every enemy has a total of four pins they can drop, one for each difficulty, and each pin has a different drop rate, and it isn't necessarily just higher difficulty means rarer pins. Obviously if you want to get the most unique and rarest pins in the game, you're going to have to crank that difficulty up as high as you can, and the chances of getting those pins are still going to be pretty low. But you can come across situations where pin drop rates are maxed out on two or more difficulties, which guarantees the higher difficulty drop every time. In situations like that, you'll 
you'll actually want to lower the difficulty in order to get certain pin drops that are locked to normal or even easy. And the risk reward aspects of this system just keep coming, since not only are you in control of how many battles you participate in, which noise symbols you want to fight, and what difficulty the game's set to, you also have direct control of your team's level. If you play through the game on max level, you're going to have an easier time, but just like adding battles, lowering your level increases your drop rate, and once you've somewhat mastered the system, you can pretty easily tackle anything the game throws at you at level 1 without much trouble. It manages to pull this off because the only thing that the party's level controls is the total HP of the group. Unlike most RPGs, characters' HP stats aren't tracked individually while in battle, it's all pulled together in a total team HP, and all other stats are separate and not affected. So even if you lower your party's level, if their other stats are built up well enough, the lower HP number doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world, even against tough bosses on the ultimate difficulty. And raising the party's stats is another pretty cool thing that carries over from the first game too. There's two main ways to increase your party's stats, food and threads. Food is the most unique mechanic here, since it's the only way to increase your team's individual stats, HP, attack, defense, and style permanently. Like I just said, the party's level exclusively governs total team HP, and nobody gets stat boosts when they level up, so you need to chow down like a monster to get the best stats. When you enter a restaurant, your team will have a fullness meter, and by giving everybody a meal, it'll increase their stats while also increasing fullness. You want to keep fullness below 100%, because if it ever goes above, the team won't be able to eat again until it's hit zero, whereas normally you could get a snack in between battles if you wanted to. Come on, Square, let me feed everybody a whole alligator for every meal. You know they'd love it. I seriously love what Square did with food this time around, since you actually have to keep track of what everybody likes a lot more than you used to. Now there's no penalty for giving Nagi some vegetables instead of tendies, the game would be a 0 out of 10 if there was, but if you give someone a food that they really love, there's a chance that they'll get bonus stats from that meal. It's a really cool system, and it's super important to the party's battling potential, and the devs knew it, since whenever you walk by a restaurant at zero fullness, you'll get a reminder that everybody is literally starving to death and you need to feed them right now, or or something to that effect. It really is the sort of thing that you need to keep up with as you play, since if you ignore it, you're just gonna end up really weak relative to what you have to fight really quickly. The other way to increase the party's stats is with threads, and there's five different types this time around. Hats, tops, bottoms, shoes, and accessories. Each thread will have its own stat boosts, which is useful enough on its own, but what ends up being far more important are the thread abilities. These can be absolutely game-changing, ranging from simple stuff like stat stat boosts or status resists, but can also be really clutch like surviving a fatal hit or auto HP regen. Leveling up your party member's style is super important because of this, since while any party can wear any combination of any thread, if a person's style isn't high enough, their thread's abilities will remain locked and they won't get the vast majority of those benefits. I would argue that style is the most important stat in the game because of this and should be your top priority when choosing food for the first several hours of the game at the very least. Now, unlike the first game, which brands you choose for threads don't really make that much of a difference. In The World Ends With You, what threads you wore affected the popularity of certain brands, giving their pins bonus damage in battle. This mechanic is completely gone in Neo, and I'm totally okay with that. While I did like the mechanic, especially narratively, since it showed how the Reaper's game affects the RG ever so slightly, it really wasn't that important, and doing away with it lets the player choose threads more deliberately for long-term battle benefits, not ethereal area bonuses. And since that pretty much covers everything outside of battles, let's finally head into them and see how Neo handles this system. There were a lot of things that made the battle system in The World Ends With You amazing. Not only is it super unique, but it's incredibly complex, effectively being two different battles happening at the same time that you not only had to keep track of independently, but also had to synchronize together to see the most success with. Its complexity was rightfully daunting, to the point that many people weren't able to wrap their heads around it properly, but I loved every second of it. While yes, it is complex, it is also so intricately and carefully designed that if you were paying attention, nothing was actually all that overwhelming and you could very easily get into a flow state where everything just fell into place. It was, in my opinion, a system that was far greater than the sum of its parts, in a game where any of these individual parts could be considered great in their own right. Neo doesn't quite manage to hit that same level of complexity and nuance, but it's certainly not for a lack of trying. 
annoying. It takes the vast majority of the same parts and modifies them in a way that is more conductive to one of these instead of one of these, but there are some really important things that are lost in the translation and it ends up feeling far more chaotic and unwieldy than it should. Okay, let's start with the basics here. When you enter a battle, you'll be controlling Rindo and he can only do a few things, those being dodging enemy attacks with a button press, moving around with the control stick, and using his equipped pin. Much like the previous game, pins are the main way of attacking enemies and pin commands are just as deep a rabbit hole here as they were in the first game. There are well over 300 different attacking pins and while there are quite a few command overlaps, even the ones that do are fairly well differentiated, especially between brands. There are 14 different brands for pins this time around to match each of the clothing brands and they all have their own unique playstyles. Jupiter of the Monkey, my go-to brand in both games, focuses on close range and melee psychs like Shockwave and Vulcan Uppercut. They're great centerpiece psychs and you can choose your remaining pin slots to synergize with them. For instance, Natural Puppy's Force Rounds pins work really well for that as their long range projectile moves, so while Rindo's up close, Fret can be in the back blasting away from relative safety. And as you'd probably expect, since all of these pins have different unique effects, they all also have different commands for each type of pin. This is one thing that I was really worried about before playing the game, since so much of that first game's combat was designed around either a touchscreen or a pointer, where you had a nearly infinite number of possible unique inputs. Attempting to squeeze that down into a controller with a very obviously finite number of buttons was always going to be a necessary challenge, because it's not like every system they wanted to bring this game to had the ability to use touch commands. Oh man, imagine having to use the PlayStation touchpad for all of your pin commands. Ugh. I'm getting nauseous just thinking about it. Their solution is fairly clever, all things considered. The game uses six possible buttons for its commands, and how it divides up its commands depends on those buttons. For instance, the two pin types I talked about earlier, the shockwave and force rounds, are mapped to the two face buttons, since it's relatively easy to mash those buttons if necessary. The shoulder buttons are typically used for less physically intensive commands. You'll usually have to hold these commands to charge them up, rather than focus on executing a lot of button presses which is considerate for people's hands. Now, with a bunch of different effects, you would also expect pins to have stats of their own, and they definitely do, like elemental affinity, leveling rates, and their own attack stats. But what's stopping you from just finding a bunch of the most powerful pins in the game, equipping only them forever, and steamrolling through everything you find? Well, Neo actually has quite a few different solutions to this. First is that pin evolution returns, so you won't be able to find the top tier pins early on, even on higher difficulties. And thankfully, the pin evolution mechanics are far, far simpler than they were in the first game. On the DS, you had to evolve pins by battling, by not battling, by not playing the game, by playing Tin Pin Slammer, and you even had to evolve pins by going outside, and let me tell you, I did not like that. Evolution in Neo is basically just from gaining battle experience. The main twist is that there are some pins that only evolve when a certain person is using them, and you won't be able to see those requirements until very late in the game via the social network. This makes evolving specific pins for completion pretty easy in the post game, but keeps the process of evolution and finding new pins a bit more organic and surprising during regular play, and I like that a lot. Beyond evolution, Neo also introduces a new type of pin known as an uber pin. These are ultra powerful pins that usually don't evolve, but are significantly stronger than what you'd normally find at any one point in the game. Neo balances these out pretty well by limiting the amount of uber pins you can use at any one time. At the start of the game, you can only equip one, and you slowly gain more uber slots by completing the social network. This is good for encouraging people to change up their builds during gameplay, since if you see a new, super powerful uber pin, but you're already full up on them, you'll probably want to reconsider your team's setup to try to work this new one into the build. And it really is a ton of fun exploring what pins do what and how you can use them in battle. Different pins synergize with others in different ways, and it's really important that your team's pin build synergize as well, since that's how you build up this game's version of a super move, the mashup. Every pin has a special requirement in battle that upon meeting it will spawn a beat drop opportunity. By hitting that enemy with any other pin during that window, we'll add it to the groove meter and once you hit 100%, you'll be able to do a mashup. Now this is a pretty cool mechanic since it's quite a bit different from the first game specials which only had three variants for each partner. Now there's a different mashup attack for each element depending on what pins you're using. Obviously they'll be helpful regardless, but the 
mashup that spawns a bunch of slow moving projectiles isn't going to do much against the fast moving wolf enemies, it's much better to drop a fireball on the whole area instead. Just like the first game, there are three levels to the mashup, with the first being weakest and the second being stronger, but the third is completely different. At the end of week two, you get the ability to build your groove meter up to 300%, and doing so lets you unleash a killer remix. This is the strongest attack you can possibly do in the game, to the point where saving up groove just prior to a boss is something I did a ton. Since if you start with like 200% by fighting smaller battles beforehand, you can quickly and relatively easily build up to 300 during the fight, hit the button, and mash until your fingers can mash no more. More often than not, unless you're on the ultimate difficulty or something, you're likely to take out three quarters of the enemy's health, if not wipe them out completely. If the enemy doesn't end up as a pile of goo afterwards, you're probably still going to be fine, since the killer remix gives your team a full HP restore as well. I literally never equipped a healing pin in my second playthrough at all here, because killer remixes did just as good a job as a party heal as any other pin would. What's more is that if you finish off an enemy or group of enemies with a killer remix, that will boost your item drop rate by another three times, and even if you're already lowering your level for item drops, ending battles with killer remixes is pretty much a must in order to get the rarest pin drops out there. Killer remixes end up being really important during Nagi's dive battles, as you're forced into reduction battles with enemies that have various buffs like increased damage or HP drain, and can wipe you out incredibly quickly if you aren't paying attention. Now all of this seems fine, and it is, but there is one thing about how pins and psychs work that both defines how this game is played, but also ends up as its biggest pitfall. In the first game, Neku could equip up to six pins at once, but here, each person can only equip one at a time. This seems like it's a small change, six pins on one guy compared to six pins across six people, but it makes a world of difference. While yeah, Neku could equip six pins at once, he could only ever use one of them at any one time, so your battle plans had to be very deliberate. You needed to know exactly how each of your pins worked, how they were activated, which order similar pins would activate, how they interacted, that sort of thing. Your build had to be very well thought out, or you'd be having a very bad time time very quickly. That kind of just falls apart in Neo, especially once you've fully fitted your team out with six characters. Just think about this for a second, you've got six characters with six different abilities and six different input requirements spread across six buttons. And not only do you need to juggle each of these inputs individually, but you have to try to time inputs properly for beat drops, keep track of your pin usage to try to make sure you don't put important ones into recharge for no reason, and make sure your allies don't get themselves killed. Now your allies Allies will dodge enemy attacks automatically when you aren't controlling them directly, but only if they aren't using a pin. So on top of all of this other information you need to be mindful of, and an ever-changing set of controller inputs that you need to juggle, you also need to be aware of where all of your allies are when you're using pins, since if you're fighting a strong enemy, you can very easily end up in a situation where everything seems fine, then you're just dead for some reason because an enemy off-screen walloped one of your team members since you accidentally let go of L1 instead of L2 for just a second. I really need to explain how hard this can be to control. A game having a lot of unique inputs isn't an issue, obviously, that's just how games are nowadays. Most of them will have unique things to every single possible input, sometimes multiple inputs per button. However, this remains reasonable even for more novice players because most games don't have you juggling all of them at once. Most commands in most games are going to be independent from one another and won't be able to overlap, you know what I mean? If you're charging a strong attack in Bloodborne, you aren't going to be simultaneously dodging, chugging a blood vial, jumping, shooting your pistol, and changing weapons. That game's hard enough as it is, having to do one action at a time. Now imagine you're in charge of six hunters, one doing each of these actions. That's kind of how it feels to battle in Neo. Multitasking is literally not a thing that the human brain can do, but in order to maximize your efficiency in battle, you basically have to. What's even more brain melting is that it's different from, say, learning how to play an instrument, where you can put things into muscle memory and sort of program polyrhythms into your brain to do these sorts of things without thinking about them too much. Now imagine you're learning to play piano, but which keys are white and black change every hour and a half. You just can't ever get into a proper flow unless you use the exact same inputs for your team at all times. And to be sure, you can't just button mash and get great results here. There is order to be found within the sea of chaos, I just never managed to have it fully materialize. <sighs> I kind of understand people who couldn't get into the first game's combat now, since this has to have been how they felt. The combat just ends up as a bunch of sensory overload and you can't effectively manage it 100% of the time anyways, 
so you just have to make a bunch of compromises with its mechanics to try to make it more manageable for yourself. What I ended up doing was just attacking in bursts. When a battle started, I unloaded everything all at once, and once my team went into cooldown, I was able to survey the battlefield to see what enemies were doing and what I should tackle next. It kind of morphed into a turn-based system that way, but that's how I made it work. You could also be a lot more choosy with how your team attacks, effectively doing a one pin at a time strategy, but the time requirements for rankings are so stringent that I guarantee that wouldn't end up being very effective, even if it would eliminate a lot of the things you'd have to keep track of at one time. Now the game does have a few things that kind of lessen the cognitive load when fully loaded out, if you unlock it from the social network. On top of allowing multiple uber pins, which on its own is great since their strength can make battles go quicker on their own, you eventually get the ability to assign more than one pin to a single input, and that can be very good. That way, instead of having to fumble around with six unique attack buttons all the time, you can lower that down to four if you are willing to have three of your allies using the same type of psych. Strategically, that probably isn't a good idea, but I typically had two people using the same input just to reduce the amount of smoke billowing out of my ears. So yeah, it pretty much just ends up being a huge mess. It's really ironic that doing well in battle builds up your groove, since mechanically it does everything it can to make sure that getting comfortable enough with the system to get into a groove yourself is nearly impossible. Now I certainly wouldn't go so far as to say that it isn't fun or anything, I still had a good time with it. The pin abilities themselves are fun and interesting, building up to killer remixes is really rewarding, and the enemy and boss designs are typically really cool. Some of the later bosses in particular have really fun gimmicks and unique mechanics that freshen up the experience a ton, but man, knowing that my feeble meat can computer simply isn't sophisticated enough to get 100% out of this system without spending hundreds or more hours mastering the rhythm of every pin combination, and learning every enemy pattern and weakness is just frustrating at a meta level. I did have fun while in battle, especially once I found a set of pins that I was able to wield somewhat effectively, but it never reached the level of satisfaction that can be found in similarly complex RPGs like Baton Kaido's Origins or the original The World Ends With You. And I feel like the team's strict adherence to the ideas and mechanics from the first game was basically the combat's Achilles heel, especially the six pin loadouts. Just changing this would have done so much to improve the experience and make it much more legible. As an example, they could have dropped down to a three person party, so you'd only need to keep track of three pins at a time, giving each party member unique abilities that change the effects of pins to make everyone unique. Party members outside of battle could have favorite brands that give damage boosts to those brands' pins, kind of recreating the brand popularity mechanic but in a more deliberate, team building fashion. Most other things wouldn't even need to be changed aside from balance to keep up a quick battle pace, but whatever solution there could be, it really needed at least one. Things are somewhat manageable in the first half of the game when it's three or four pins at maximum, but every pin beyond that really does exponentially increase the complexity and it doesn't really get any easier. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get back into the positive aspects of the game and start talking about the presentation, which, surprise surprise, is really dang good. Obviously, the visual style here is based on what was done in the DS game, being themed around underground graffiti art and that whole general subculture. That general theme is still the backbone to this game's art style, and it works just as well here. The menus look great, the character designs are striking, although some of them are a little bit too busy for my liking, and it's just really nice to look at. I'm particularly impressed with how they managed to translate a lot of the first game's 2D sprite art into 3D. A ton of the characters and enemies first seen there have been brought here and given full 3D models, and they're mostly great. The choice to go with cell shading for the models does do a lot of the heavy lifting to be sure, but that style really works here and I'm really happy with how good it looks. On the audio side of things, I'm also really happy with how it turned out. I was really worried about how a sequel to The World Ends With You would end up, because one of the most important aspects of that game's overall feel and tone was the music, which was composed by the legendary Takiharu Ishimoto, and considering the fact that he left Square Enix in 2017, filling that gap and the identity of the game would be a huge task. Thankfully though, when Neo got announced, I was very relieved to hear that Ishimoto was going to be returning, and I am very glad that he did. The soundtrack here has a lot of remixes from the original game, including some of my favorites like Three Minutes Clapping, Calling, and Twister, and also my not-so-favorites like O Parts. But it's the original tracks here that are much more interesting. The battle music is already more metal and rock-inspired than it already was, which does make the battles a lot more intense. World is yours is an awesome track that is way more important than you'd probably think it was just from listening to it. 
Get an anomaly fulfills me, takes me higher, some place I've never been. I'm about to wake up, let it begin, watch it burn, like a fire burn. I'm coming back until the world is yours, the world be mine. And Breaking Free is a clear winner for the best song in the game, being a powerful track about wanting to live your life the way you want to and be free of the world's expectations. <laughs> It works really well as Rindo's theme, as that's kind of his main struggle throughout the story. Other songs are quite a bit more eclectic and unique, borrowing from several different genres all at once to create some incredibly interesting music. Incongruous is a clear standout, going from a house intro to rock, to rap, to pop, and then metal all over the course of just a few minutes. To the It's one of my favorite tracks just to listen to because of how much of a journey it manages to be. However, it does include one section that has become a bit of a point of friction for me. Listen to the rap section here. And now, listen to the rap section in another one of these tracks, Bird in the Hand. Yeah, it's the exact same sample used in two songs in the same soundtrack. Let me be perfectly clear, I have no problem with sampling in music, even reusing samples. Heck, sometimes it's fun hearing the same samples used in multiple songs. Like, did you know that the rap verse in the original version of Persona 3's Iwato Dai Dorm theme is also used in Star Ocean 3's Bitter Dance? Yeah, that's fun. Neither song is lesser in my opinion by using the same sample because there's enough distance between them. Same with any of the other countless other songs that use the same samples for their own purposes. But man, hearing the exact same sample used in the exact same way across two different songs in the same game is really distracting. This is definitely a nitpick because I do still like these songs individually, but it feel like it does ever so slightly make the overall listening experience of the soundtrack a little less great. It is still great overall. Beyond the music, I'm pretty impressed with the voice acting overall as well. They brought back almost all of the original voice actors from the first game, which is really great, and they're given a lot more to do here since many main scenes are fully voiced this time around. They all do a great job, and even though it's been like 13 years since all of them played their characters, they all managed to get into their roles seamlessly. The new voice cast are also really good here, with Fret and Canon's voice actors in particular pulling out some really great performances. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the story because I want to try to finish this video this century. So you guys know the drill, there's going to be a timestamp somewhere around here if you want to skip this part. Anyways, let's get going. So as I said earlier, the first few weeks are mostly set up where we get a lot of the game's mysteries introduced. Like we don't know who the leader of the Runebringers is despite them being on top of the leaderboard basically every week. Rindo keeps getting these visions that show the city being destroyed and every time Rindo activates his replay power, the day ends with these weird birds appearing and flying away. We have no idea what that is but Minami Moto seems really interested in them so that can't be good. The first few weeks is also where we start to build out character relationships and arcs. I feel like before we go further into the actual plot, we do need to dive deeper into these because they are the emotional backbone of the story and the plot really doesn't have all that much going for it without them. And we're going to start with the game's lead, Rindo. So Rindo gets a bit of a bad rep from many people who play the game and honestly for good reason. From the very start of the game he comes off as a wet blanket, someone who doesn't really want to be in this situation and is just trying to do the bare minimum to get by in order to lay low, not draw 
attention to himself and barely eek by. It almost seems like he'd rather just let everyone else do everything so he can spend all of his time on his phone chatting with Swallow, his only friend on Fango. Now, there's a reason why Rindo was put into this position, and him being so indecisive and meek was a big part of it, but the fact that there's a post-game lore explanation as to why Rindo isn't a compelling protagonist doesn't retroactively make him more compelling. What makes him more frustrating to follow is the fact that he doesn't really grow that much as a person for the vast majority of the game. He does get a little more assertive and confident in his decision making near the very end of the story, but even then he has to be pushed to the very brink to get him to make a truly difficult choice on his own. Not even seeing one of his idols fall from grace before his eyes is enough to get him to fully be his own person. Motoy, the leader of the Pure Hearts, was apparently an online poet slash artist named Another, whose work Rindo really admired and even supposedly built a lot of his own thinking and worldview on. Unfortunately, eventually we learn that Motoy's entire career was a lie. He built his brand by stealing other people's art and claiming it as his own. None of Another's words were his own. Now this does push Rindo in the right direction, and he does start to realize that he can't just rely on other people to live his life for him, resulting in the decision to let Shoka join up with the Twisters after she gets kicked out of the Reapers, but when things start to go wrong again, he quickly regresses and has to rely on everyone else to keep pushing forward. Now by the end of the game, he has grown quite a bit and starts to resemble the type of protagonist most people would like to see, and it's satisfying to see him change like this, but for me it comes too quickly and is too backloaded in the story to see his journey as natural or truly fulfilling. Fred, on the other hand, is by far my favorite character in the game. His arc is pretty much a masterclass. It's paced well, hinted at throughout the entire experience, and is something that he's constantly struggling with and trying to work on, even if he isn't directly willing to talk to anyone else about it. At the start, he comes off as the typical happy-go-lucky buddy character to Rindo, the yin to his yang to balance them out and make them a more engaging duo. And that's something that he keeps up for the majority of the game, bouncing off beat really well and trying to keep things light and positive between anyone else they meet, including their enemies. But there's a lot more going on underneath the surface here, and we're only really able to see any of that because of the leader of the Varia Beauties, Kanon. As the leader of a team, Kanon has to be a charismatic leader, and is not only incredibly determined to win the game and come back to life, but also has to be able to win people over to her team. Motoy did this with meaningless quote mines to make people think he's deep and smart, Fuya of the Deep River Society did it with his undying love of river waifus, but Kanon is a little different. She managed to get where she is because she is truly strategic, cunning, incredibly emotionally intelligent, and knows how to get people to do what she wants. And because she is so good at reading people, from the very first moment that he and Kanon meet, she's able to see a lot more about Fret than pretty much anyone else can. Every time they meet, Fret perks up and tries his best to be the most positive and likable guy there ever was. He takes any negative news in stride, tries to see the good in any situation, and absolutely floods Kanon with compliments and agreements. But she immediately sees through this facade and knows that Fred is struggling with something and just putting on a face to keep up appearances. When she says something like, my, aren't you the charmer? Say, I know we're technically rivals, but if you ever need to talk about something, I'm always happy to listen. Obviously, your first instinct is to say that it's about the game, but it isn't, at least not really. It's a hint that there's something else going on here, and it only gets more obvious after that point. Every time they interact, Fred will say something to her and Kanon will respond by telling him to try to be more genuine. He stews in that advice for a while, not exactly knowing what she means or not wanting to, at least until late in week 3 where disaster strikes. This is the day that Rindo loses his memories and has to try to use replay to figure out what happened. Eventually, after regaining his memories, he realizes that Kanon has become their enemy. She has been possessed by a new noise called Plague Noise that warps your mind into thinking everyone is your enemy and then erases you from within forever. By the time the team finally reaches her, it's already too late and there's nothing they can do that will really be able to save her, but Fret tries anyway. If nothing else, this lets Kanon spend her last few minutes as herself, and she thanks him for that before being erased. This moment is when Fret finally confronts all of the things she said to him in his mind and lets everyone know what's been going on. Before the events of the game, he had a friend, his best friend, who was struggling. Fret did everything he could do to be there for him, trying everything under the sun to make things better and help his friend get through the hard times. But it wasn't enough, and he ended up taking his own life. This broke Fret because he tried so hard and it wasn't enough, so why even try? Why take anything seriously? If nothing you do matters, there's no reason to truly care about anything. From that point, he took on the happy persona that we know. But facing Kanon's death, he vows to be a person that she can respect, to be more genuine, and be a better, more
more caring person. This truly is the best arc in the game and really rivals Neku's from the first in a lot of ways too. They kind of have similar motivations and struggles, they just decided to cope with their pain in vastly different ways. That makes it even more interesting how they were able to explore similar trauma from completely different perspectives. I wish I could say as many nice things about Nagi, but unfortunately she's by far my least favorite character out of the main cast here. That's not to say she doesn't have depth or anything, because she does, but it's even more buried than Rindo's and she doesn't even have that much of an arc to speak of. At the very best she reacts to Fret's arc, which really only makes him stand out even more. So on the surface she's a very stereotypical mega geek archetype. She obsesses over her hobby to an unhealthy degree, she speaks in the most overly verbose word salad that you'd ever hear, and she's just really, really annoying most of the time. She idolizes Minami Moto because he kinda looks like a character in her favorite video game, and applies characteristics to him that don't exist in order to feed her fantasy. So yeah, she's kind of hard for people to interact with, and she never really tries to change that, at least on her own. Fret tries a lot to try to talk to her and be her friend, considering that they're on the same team and everything, but for the vast majority of the game she straight up ignores him or tries her best to let him know that his input is not welcome. Now of course there is a bit of a deeper meaning below all of that as well. Later on she's shown to be very emotionally intelligent in her own right, and much like Canon, she sees directly through Fret's fake happiness, but unlike Canon, who's able to try to nudge Fret in the right direction, all Nagi does is reject Fret entirely as a person outright until he's conquered his demons. She does start conversing with him more normally after this point, but I have a very hard time justifying that as a point in Nagi's favor, since all the growth and introspection was done by Fret. Nagi just rewarded his development by not treating him like garbage anymore. The game does try to give her some more human flaws, like saying that she struggles under pressure and is likely to fail just when it's the most important not to, but that like never comes into play throughout the entire game. Every time she's needed to dive, no matter the stakes, she never actually fails, so this trait is pretty pointless. Now there are plenty of other characters to meet, but we'll see them more as we go through the plot. There are quite a few twists and turns during the last week of the game, so let's get right into that. So, by the end of the second week, everyone's basically had as much as they can take of the game and formulate a plan to try to take out the Ruinbringers once and for all. The Wicked Twisters, which now includes Shoka after being removed from the Reapers for secretly helping Rindo's team in a few missions, take out Suzukichi for the second time, the first being at the end of week one, and the Varia Beauties focus on the second member of the Ruinbringers, Sugumi Matsune. And this is where she comes back into the picture. Yeah, this is the girl from the first teaser for Neo back in 2012. There's a lot of weirdness and and plot holes surrounding her because the game as it is now is far different than what it was originally meant to be. Tsugumi here was designed to be the game's protagonist, a high schooler who was brought into the game to fight for her life. But now, her story is quite a bit different and we learn one of these major changes right after we beat her. With both members of the Ruinbringers defeated, the Twisters and Varia Beauties think that they've won and the Ruinbringers will be erased. But things aren't so simple. Shiba, the Game Master, joins everyone on the battlefield and drops a bombshell. He he is the leader of the Ruinbringers, and he has decreed that they have won. So yeah, the Ruinbringers are not regular players, but are instead a group of Reapers acting specifically to weed out weak players from the game. Now I figured this out pretty quickly considering Susukichi here sprouted antlers very reminiscent of Reaper markings in his first fight, but if you don't know what a Reaper looks like when fighting, this is probably a big shock. And yeah, that's a big change to Sugumi's character, she's now part of the Shinjuku Reapers, who immigrated to Shibuya after Shinjuku was destroyed, and that seems to be what Shiba's plan actually is, to destroy Shibuya just like Shinjuku, which leads us directly into week 3. The start of week 3 sees everything change. There's no official missions anymore, the game is in a new mode, Sudden Death. If you beat Shiba, you win, and if you don't, you die. And with this new mode, Shiba's brought in Plague Noise to try to get an upper hand on the players. This also had a big effect on the sky, as it's no longer bright and blue, it's an ocean of grey, which is probably not a good sign. There's a deeper reason for this change, but we'll learn about that a little later on. Day 1 is spent trying to figure out how to defeat the plague noise, since it's far more dangerous than any noise before it, and it seems mostly invincible. The trick narratively is to shine a black light on it, which renders it fully visible and making it easy to defeat. Thankfully, that's not a mechanic you need to worry about, turning this game into Alan Wake would be a nightmare. It's all handled through the story, but these truly are the most dangerous of all noise. They're tanky, they do tons of 
damage and what's worse is that they drain your groove like a poison when they hit you. You really need to keep on your toes when they're around. Day 2 is the day that Shoka gets the majority of her development. Up until this point she's been very defiant, bored with the game and wanting to spruce things up a bit to try to make it more interesting. To the point that she actively betrayed the Reapers to help the Twisters win more missions. That betrayal wasn't something that was taken lightly by the Reapers and especially by Ayano who originally acted as Shoka's mentor when she joined up with the Reapers. They quickly became like sisters and Shoka being kicked out of the Reapers was hard on both of them. But Shiba doesn't care about any of that, he just wants revenge for making the game last as long as it has, so he decides to use Ayano as a weapon against the Twisters, both figuratively and literally. Ayano texts Shoka saying that Shiba has infected her with plague noise and that she's going to die. Now obviously this is a trap and the Twisters do end up having to fight Ayano, but not until a pretty interesting section where Rindo goes back in time multiple times to try to convince Shoka that fighting may be the only answer. It's a really good section that shows quite a bit of how the relationship between Rindo and Shoka have grown over just a few days. At the end of the second week, they were basically at each other's throats, since Shoka betrayed the Twisters too to try to get back into the Reapers, but after changing her mind and working together for a few days, they've definitely grown a lot closer and are getting along a lot more. Of course, Ayano does end up succumbing to the noise, but there was another trick. During the time that the team was wasting trying to take Ayano down, Shiba's noise has been multiplying, and now there's seemingly too much of it to stop. We don't really need to talk much about Day 3, since we've already done so, it's the day that Kanon dies, so we'll head right into Day 4. Day 4 has the team trying to erase the source of all of Shiba's new plague noise, and once they do, they're greeted by a few unfriendly faces. First is a man named Tanzo Kubo, a Shinjuku Reaper who had been showing up here and there throughout the game, but never really did anything important. Well, here's where he makes his big move. He calls himself the Noise Master, and true to his name, is actually able to control the plague noise that Shiba created, which is something that no other Reaper can actually do. He sicks them on the Twisters, but they actually win. Before Kubo can summon more or take the fight into his own hands, he's hit by somebody we haven't seen in a while, Minami Moto. But of course, he isn't actually here to help the team out, he's got his own plans, and frankly, the Twisters are just going to get in the way. See, he's figured out what the birds that appear whenever Rindo turns back time are, and is planning to use them to acquire enough strength to achieve his goals. Once he's got some of that power, he transforms and another fight ensues. We complete the fight, but obviously Tabuti here is too much to handle for the team. Beat stays behind to try to prevent him from chasing after the rest, but even he can't stand up to the onslaught. Just before Minami Moto lands the final blow, we get a scene that really just sent me to the moon. A bright flash of light happens, stopping Minami Moto in his tracks, and as the light fades, the figure is revealed to be none other than Neku himself. Now I figured that Neku would be showing up at some point, they wouldn't bring him up as some legendary player early on, and fake us out with Beat's outfit without planning on having him show up at some triumphant moment, but it still hits so hard and I was so happy to see him back. His design is really great too, showing how much he's changed as a person. His posture is more open, his eyes are calmer, he's no longer wearing headphones, having thrown them away at the end of the first game. This is a Neku that has gone through the game and has come out on the other side as a better person. And on top of that, the fact that he was able to Oko Minami Moto shows that his skills as a player are just as sharp as ever too, and we are definitely going to be needing that as things are about to get rough. We get a few revelations here on day 5, and they all center around Coco, who we got reintroduced to back in week 2. We didn't really know exactly what she was up to, but she's back in Shibuya and is definitely on a mission. On the last day of week 2, she finds the doll that Sugumi was carrying, which is the same Mr. Mew doll that Shiki made prior to the events of the first game. The doll seems to have some special importance, and we learn why here. It turns out the doll is no mere pig. It has been turned into a vessel that contains Sugumi's soul. Now, why or how Sugumi got her hands on Mr. Mew is never really explained. It's just another thing that got lost after many of the game's plans were changed over the decade in between the original designs and the final release, but she has it, and her soul is held within it. This is actually a part of why Coco did what she did at the end of Final Remix's A New Day. She killed Neku again, not because she particularly wanted him dead, but in order to send him to Shinjuku to help prevent the city's erasure, as Koko and Tsukumi are longtime friends, and Koko wanted to save her. Unfortunately, he did end up failing that mission, and the city was erased, but somehow Tsukumi survived and joined up with the Reapers afterwards. The problem is that since her soul is locked inside Mr. Mew, she can't easily tell us what's going on, why the fall of Shinjuku happened, 
happened and what can be done to save Shibuya from the same fate. Nagi uses her dive ability to go inside the doll and we do get some answers to a few of our questions. First is that the visions that Rindo has been receiving weren't related to his pin or replay powers at all. Sugumi has been sending out visions of the future to anyone who could receive them and it turns out that Rindo and Neku were the ones who were able to resonate with them and view them. Next is that the biggest threat to Shibuya is known as dissonance. No reaper or player could have sent the twisters into the game while alive as the dimensions are supposed to be entirely separate and the only thing that could have caused them to merge like this is dissonance. We don't know exactly what is causing it yet but if it continues an inversion will happen resulting in Shibuya's destruction and we are seeing signs that it's getting close as the sky turning gray is an indication that an inversion is imminent. Oh and before we move on I need to say that I absolutely love what they did with Coco in this game. I didn't like her pretty much at all in Final Remix. Her dialogue was annoying as hell and her design while not awful didn't feel like it really fit super well with the vibe of The World Ends With You. Her glow up in Neo is absolutely legendary. Not only is her design leagues better, fitting much better with her personality, but her entire vibe has been changed as well. She's no longer the obnoxious person who says OMG LMFAO in real life unironically, instead trying really hard to be this soft spoken cutesy girl that everyone can like. Of course, her spicy side is still around and it works so much better here. Coco even has the best interaction in the entire game. Nanny Moto! 07734. Ew. Hey! Don't just spout off numbers and walk away, you jerk! This was worth the purchase for that scene alone. Coco's voice actor killed it. That ew is the best delivered word in the game. Anyways, day six really just has us tying up some loose ends with Susukichi. He plays a bit of a game with the twisters, saying that he'll tell them where Shiba is if they find him. Of course, this was a trap and he locks the twisters in the Shibuya River. Now on the surface, this is in order to keep them from interfering with Shiba's plans, but Susukichi isn't actually a bad guy and he's got a good head on his shoulders even if he can't take a selfie to save his life. Upon confronting him, they engage in battle and after winning, Shoka figures out what he was actually trying to do. Susukichi knew that there was something different about the Shibuya River, a fact that Neku is well aware of, since it still flows from Shinjuku despite that city being erased. Susukichi was trying to lock the twisters in the river so that even if the city was destroyed, Shoka and her friends would be safe. With his last breaths, he tells the twisters where Shiva can be found, the scramble crossing, and asks them to stop him. And here we are on the final day of the final week, now, unlike any other day between both games, this one is actually split up into three parts that kind of play out as their own individual days in their own right. Thankfully though, a lot of it is kind of muddled up with time travel shenanigans that kind of reduces the amount of stuff I need to talk about, so let's try to wrap this up. It's the final day and the city of Shibuya is basically in ruins so there's only one thing left to do, take out Shiba and save the city. The twisters confront him and a battle ensues. This is a really interesting fight but honestly I wouldn't say that it's amazing. There is a nice rhythm to it, you have to dodge attacks in just the right way since Shiba is teleporting around the area and you can't always land beat drops on him making it more difficult but I don't know, I just wasn't that wowed by it. At least until the second phase. After beating Shiba, the twisters are teleported back to Shibuya but something is very wrong. The skyline is back to normal but it starts glitching out and freezes and soon enough all the pedestrians start transforming into an endless stream of noise that they have to fight back. This was really cool and I thought it was a great way to end the fight but it was just a fake out. After this section is Shiba's phase 3 and it's just a slightly harder version of his first phase. Again, good, but not mind-blowing. Eventually he goes down and everyone thinks that the ordeal is finally over. They win the game and they've earned their wishes to go back to the RG. But of course, things aren't quite as they seem. Just as the dust starts to settle, who else waltzes in but Tanzo Kubo? It turns out that he isn't just the noise master, he had another, more sinister purpose. A light starts shining from Rindo's player pin and all of a sudden, a countless amount of red bird noise spawn from the pin. Now you may not have noticed this before the characters themselves brought it up, but every day since the start of the game, Rindo's pin has been changing slightly from the standard Shinjuku Reaper pin design to its current design reminiscent of the red bird noise. I think this was really clever as if you were paying attention you'd notice that something was wrong with the pin even early on, but it never gave enough away for you to be able to 
properly put all of the pieces together. Sure, the pin was changing a bit, and sure, the birds spawned after each replay, and that was definitely related, but you had no way to know for sure that the noise created, which we eventually learn is made from abandoned souls and thoughts left behind in discarded timelines whenever Rindo turns back time, were concentrating in that pin, which is what caused it to change. Thankfully, Kubo, being an anime villain, is more than happy to tell us his plans. He always planned for Shibuya to be destroyed, but had hoped that Shibo would be able to do the job on his own. However, since he failed, he put his backup plan into action, which he had planted on Rindo at the start of the game. Kubo himself isn't a normal reaper. He says he's an angel from a higher plane than the Yuji who was sent to destroy the city, just like he did in Shinjuku. And his plan here seems foolproof. The noise he spawns destroys the city easily, and if Rindo were to go back in time again to try to stop it, the amount of noise created would just multiply. But upon seeing his friends erased by the noise, he realizes that he has no other choice and replays to the start of the day. From this point, the goal is to get Shiba to put the game on hold so they can focus on the noise, which is far more difficult a task than it even seems like it would be. However, there is some hope as Shiba's old partner, Hishima, who had shown up a few times prior to this, is somewhat willing to help and goes to talk to Shiba himself. He managed to convince Shiba to put the game on hold, barely, since there is a much bigger threat that has been manipulating him from the very start. With the plan in action, Rindo attempts to change fate one final time and beat Kubo's noise once and for all. And they fail. Spectacularly. While they fight valiantly, slowly but surely, every single person is overwhelmed by the noise and erased, from Shiba to Neku, and eventually even Shoka. In her last moments, just before being erased, she confesses something to Rindo. She was Swallow, his friend in Fango, which is why he was able to contact them from within the UG. More importantly, this explains pretty much everything that Shoka has done throughout the entire game. You may not have noticed, but she'd always show up at pretty convenient times whenever the team would need a hint, or especially in the first week whenever Rindo would specifically ask Swallow for help. Now she couldn't be super obvious with her help and did a pretty good job of making Rindo think she wasn't on his side, but she was quietly and pretty effectively guiding the Twisters to outcomes that helped them stay alive. This is obviously why she got kicked out of the Reapers. Shiba learned that Shoka had been trying to move the needle in the Twisters direction, but she didn't want to lose her only friend from the outside world, so it was worth the risk. Unfortunately though, it seems like it was all for naught, as the noise erases her as well, leaving Rindo completely alone. Amongst the destruction, all that's left is Rindo and Kubo, and as he's about to declare victory and finish off Shibuya, a deus ex machina happens. Literally. A beam of light appears from the sky and snaps Kubo out of existence. The next thing we see is Rindo waking up in Shibuya, seemingly no worse for wear. Moreover, he is actually in the RG. The threat against the city is truly gone and he's back home. But the celebration doesn't last as all of his friends, Fret, Nagi, Beat, Neku, and Shoka, are still gone. Shibuya may have been saved, but there was still a great cost. As Rindo breaks down, unable to live without them, he's approached by a strange man named Haz. Haz gets Rindo to guide him throughout the city to show him the sights and get an idea as to what makes Shibuya so great. At the end of the tour, Haz reveals something spectacular. He is the one who took out Kubo, saying that he went out of line and was only meant to cleanse Shinjuku, whom Haz was in charge of as its composer, not Shibuya. Finishing up their conversation, Haz asks Rindo what makes Shibuya so special and he doesn't have an answer, since without his friends, Shibuya isn't special anymore. They were what made it so great in the first place. Hearing that, Haz gives Rindo one last decision. He offers Rindo a chance to go back again one last time to try to take out Kubo's noise and save everyone, but if he fails, Haz won't be able to bail him out again, and Shibuya will be truly destroyed. He thinks about it for a bit and decides to take the chance. The people he cares about are worth the risk, and he goes back. And here we are, the final chance to make things right. This section has a lot of moving parts thanks to the time travel and is an enormous mess that can't be broken down easily, but I'll try to boil it down as best I can. The first thing the Twisters need to do is convince Shiba to call the game off and join forces against Kubo's noise. This is particularly difficult because Haz didn't just erase Kubo, he exercised him from all timelines past, present, and future. So yeah, trying to convince Shiba to stop when the person pulling all the strings no longer ever existed is gonna be a little difficult. 
Hishima can't convince Shiba to join the Twisters in fighting against the noise on his own, so they need a trump card. This comes in the form of Sugumi, who would be able to change Shiba's mind, but she needs to be freed from Mr. Mew first. Luckily, Shiki, Mr. Mew's creator, is in town, so Rindo has to get her to Coco so she can fix Mr. Mew and free Sugumi. The team also needs a way to temper the noise a bit, and there's one person who may be able to do so. Rhyme beats younger sister. She managed to hack into the Reaper's computer systems and had been talking to Kaya, the Shinjuku Reaper who designed that system for a while about it, worried about a bunch of corrupted data that had been growing over time. By bringing them together, they can work on a plan to make the noise, which she saw as corrupted data, more manageable. But this is too big of a problem for even them, and interestingly, the breakthrough they need is given to Rindo by Minami Moto of all people, who says that in order to fight back against the noise, they'll need to awaken the people's consciousness, which has been dulled by Shiba's plague noise and the resulting Shibuya syndrome. With all the pieces in place, Sugumi convincing Shiva to join the Twisters in the fight, the roaming noise being handled by the remaining Reapers, and a plan to suppress the noise figured out by Kaye and Rhyme, all that's left to do is execute the plan, dubbed Operation Awakening. But first, we have one semi-reunion to handle. Shiki finally joins up with the crew and is delighted to see Rhyme and Beat, but she senses someone else, and knowing that Neku has finally returned, she bursts into tears. This hit me really hard, as Shiki had been waiting for Neku to come back to life ever since she was returned to the RG from the game herself. Seeing them together, even if Neku was invisible to her, just warms the heart. But while it may seem like Shiki doesn't really contribute much to the story here aside from letting Sugumi do something, even prior to this point her presence has been felt and she's actually made a huge impact on Shibuya itself. Shiki is the one who started the Gato Nero fashion brand, which Shoka decks herself out in from head to toe, and has become a huge focal point in Shibuya's fashion scene. It's really cool that while she she had been waiting for Neku to return, she wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. She was living her life and making her dreams come true, and I really appreciate that. I wonder if Aerie works with her. Anyways, they've got noise to take out, so let's do this. The team commences Operation Awakening, which involves Neku syncing up with everyone in the city, Nagi opening their minds with her dive ability, and Fret using his Remind ability to wake the citizens' minds from their Shibuya Syndrome. Neku is struggling, but he's got friends in high places. Joshua insulted that the guy who wanted to destroy Shibuya wasn't invited to the plan to save Shibuya, shows up anyways to provide emotional support. Anyways, the plan seems to work, and the souls of Shibuya Shibuya's citizens begin fighting back against the noise. Of course, this noise is beyond just powerful, but it very conveniently coalesces into a new form, that of a phoenix, which begins our final battle. This is a pretty decent fight, and it's admittedly really climactic. This is actually the fight that plays the song World Is Yours, and while it seems like a very strange choice for a final boss, at least at first, I think it works really well here, capturing the defiance the team needs to show in order to be victorious. In order to defeat the phoenix, the team has to take out each of its tail feathers, each feather representing a time that Rindo had to turn back time, which is a nice touch. Once all the feathers are gone, it's actually finally vulnerable, and fully synced up and in the groove, they unleash one final perfect remix and vanquish the noise for good. And with that, the noise is destroyed and the city is saved. But the game isn't over. Shiba is still around and he still means business. He shows up all smug like he's expecting a fight, to finish the game how he wants it, and consider Considering what the Twisters have just gone through, they're in no state to take him on. Thankfully for them, however, this was another fake out, and he reveals that he's way too exhausted to do anything after fighting the noise, so he calls the game a draw, which is basically the same as a victory for the players. With that, everyone gets to go back to the RG, at least it seems like everyone will. Unfortunately, Shoka is a Shinjuku Reaper, and if you're kicked out of their ranks once the game ends, you're erased. But content with her life and not wanting to rejoin the Reapers, Shoka decides that she'd rather just have it all end than have to live her old life forever. That's when Joshua shows up again. He reveals to Rindo and Shoka that he is Shibuya's composer, a fact that everyone who played the first game already knew, and he does the typical Joshua thing. He asks Shoka and Rindo to play a game, then snaps Shoka away, not telling Rindo what he was actually doing at all. Man, Joshua is such an ass. I love him. 
Oh, and if you didn't see it, remember the person from the very start of the game, the one that picked up Rindo's player pin and returned it to him? Yeah, that was Joshua. He seemingly was playing the long game here. He knew what was playing out all along and says that he was going to intervene if things went too badly, but it worked out just fine. And after two long years, Joshua finally grants Neku's wish and brings him back to life. There's some more wrap up stuff here, like the Shinjuku Reapers heading back to rebuild the city and the Shibuya Reapers doing what they can to pick up the pieces in the aftermath, as well as beat beating up a cat caller like the king he is. But of course, there's two storylines we really need to wrap up here. First is Neku and Shiki, who finally reunite, which was way too long coming, but Shoka is still nowhere to be found. While walking around the streets of Shibuya, Rindo, not paying attention to where he's going, bumps into a stranger in the scramble crossing, only for it to be Shoka. Apparently, she'd been trying to reach out to him for weeks, but he's been ignoring his friend and message requests. Come on, man, at least turn on your notifications. And the game ends with him accepting her friend request, finally becoming real friends. Yeah, this ending is kinda weird. It's pretty anticlimactic and schmaltzy in all the wrong ways. Now, it's not horrible, but man, I got a lot more emotional engagement from Neku and Shiki reuniting than Rindo and Shoka, who I actually spent the whole game following. I wish they had done a bit more to make their friendship a bit more important and just rewrote that last scene as, man, it was not very good. And that was Neo: The World Ends With You. I really like this game, but I don't think I'll be able to go as far as to say that I love it. There really is a lot to love here, and it continues the spirit of The World Ends With You really well, but there's just so many things that bring it down, you know? Narratively, it is decent, but loads of things get jumbled up when you start including time travel into the story structure, and the way the game handles it is very clunky at best, and ends up either removing stakes when there should be, or convoluting things beyond the point of comprehension. I do love a lot of the character stuff here, especially with Fret, but Rindo and Nagi's growth is so small in comparison and is so backloaded in the game that it's hard to take their arcs as seriously as Fret's, who genuinely struggles with his throughout the entire game up until its resolution. And I kind of feel like there was a bit of character oversaturation here, like there were way too many characters to properly have them all get a chance to be their best selves in any real way. I talked about a lot of the game's characters in this video, but I still left out a ton that were much less important to the story overall. These things, combined with some weird plot holes and some things that probably should have been rewritten, leaves the story feeling really uneven. At its best, it's incredibly satisfying and engaging, but at its worst, it's just really hard to comprehend. I did my best to do the Cliffs Notes for this video, but there really is so much more that just complicates things even further. On the gameplay side of things, it's much more consistently good with the exploration and questing being really fun, and the replay mechanic being really interesting if not used as thoroughly as I would have hoped. I loved filling in the social network to learn more about all of these characters and their lives, and the combat, while not being nearly as fun as the original games was, since the barrier of mastery is unreasonably high, still has a lot going for it that offers a pretty good experience overall. If they could just tighten things up a little and make it a little more manageable for dumb people like me with brains who don't work, it would be a lot more enjoyable. That being said, it is still enjoyable enough to make me go back and do a lot of the post-game content this time around, and I'm glad I did because there is a lot of it. First, there's an entire separate post-game day with its own story, much akin to the one from the first game that repurposes all of the characters in different roles for the sake of comedy, basically. This time around, the party is planning planning on going to Shibuya Palooza to see Def March, but Fret has lost all of their tickets. So they have to go around the city trying to get stamps in order to win a new set. It's decently fun, but the Another Day story in the first game was quite a bit more interesting. It was longer, had unique character histories and relationships, and centered around Tin Pin Slammer, a mini game that I loved but is nowhere to be found in Neo, which is really disappointing. In fact, there are no mini games in Neo at all, which really shows how limited the development time for this game actually was. Beyond that though, there is still a ton of other content. There are optional blue boss noise to be found every day, which unlock these secret reports. If you really want to know the absolute truth of the game, Rindo's place in it, and stuff like that, you need to unlock them all. If you do, and play the final boss again, you'll even get a secret ending that gives a few more breadcrumbs to try to patch up some of the holes. And of course, there's still item collection, pin collection, enemy encyclopedia collection, a super boss, and more. There's even a graffiti wall that you can place achievements on as you go 
well. This was pretty cool, and placing it right next to the cat art in Utagawa was a really nice touch. Getting 100% in this game is an absolute journey, and I didn't actually finish that this time around. I did get like 88%, which is more than good enough for me. So yeah, this is a great game, and I am definitely going to come back to it, but I don't think I'm going to end up coming back to it quite as frequently as the first game. This is pretty much just the complete package. It's almost perfect in basically every way. Now, I do admit that this did come into my life at a particularly important time, and that does increase its standing quite a bit, but Neo just has too many issues that hold it back from being a truly amazing experience. It is a great game and has a lot going for it, but it just doesn't have enough to bring it over the top. Ultimately, I feel like one of Neo's biggest problems was trying too hard to just do what the first game did on home consoles, trying to reach a standard that frankly was never going to be within their grasp. While yes, they tried to bottle that lightning again, doing as good a job as anyone could, that's just the thing, The World Ends With You was lightning in a bottle. It was a perfectly crafted game built exactly for the system it was made for, supported by a perfectly executed story, one that resonated more with me than basically any other. This was a comparison that Neo had no chance of coming out on top against, but the team still went full steam ahead to make sure those comparisons were unavoidable. So much of the first game is just impossible to properly translate from the DS, even the remix versions frankly failed to do it justice. I feel like if there were more of a clean break, taking some of the broader ideas but changing the combat style, it probably would have been able to step out from its predecessor's shadow a lot more. It still is an absolute shame that the game failed as hard as it did though. This is a series that deserves to thrive. It has nearly limitless potential for future Future installments, especially beyond the Shibuya crew, but considering its failure and how cutthroat the AAA gaming industry is nowadays, this may just be the final game we get from The World Ends With You. Honestly though, I'm just really glad that the team behind the game was able to put this together at all. It truly was a passion project from people who really wanted it to see the light of day in spite of apathy from the higher ups. The love and care they have for this world and these characters shines through very strongly, and I'm really glad that they managed to make it happen even if it took about a decade longer than I had hoped. If they ever get a chance to dive into this world again, I'll be there to support it and try to make it thrive. Thank you all so much for watching. And just before I end the video, I want to thank my amazing paid Patreon members, R.A. Miller, Anon42, Louis G, Nick Ulrich, Adora Shark, James Fish, Drawing and Stuff Artist, Ryan Powell, Lucky Wonderfish, Creeping Briar, Matthew Lorigan, Dom, Benjamin Illiff, and Parker P. Allen. You're all the best. Thank you so much.